can't know God directly as much as we would like to. God is really mystery. And then what we have to do for ourselves is make sense of that mystery. And also as we're doing that, the culture has to make sense of that mystery. And what I want to show in this slideshow is how culture and the understanding of Jesus uh, intersect because it's not the same over time. And we may believe that God is God somewhere in a way that we cannot apprehend um, in a straightforward way, but we fall short if we believe that our view of God is everybody's view of God. And certainly, that's where we are right now. We have, we have had, as we do every hundred years in this country, for about 30 to 40 years, we have had this culture in which people who have a different idea of God go after other people who have a different idea of God, and then we begin to worship God as the God we know, and the God that agrees with us, as opposed to the God that's above our thoughts and our feelings and our hearts. And what I see is that uh, religious conflict, which comes up with regularity in the world, is based on an inadequate understanding of the mystery of God and an, 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 an inadequate view of the partiality of what we see. You know, you probably have thought about God, have some views about God, and that is good. And that's all you can do. I have my own. Uh, I'm a priest. I'm supposed to know what I'm doing, but I don't always with God. And so what happens is that if I think that you ought to have the way I see God as your view of God, then we start to get into fights. And those fights are doctrinal, primarily on one level, and social on another, and then things as they have uh, over the last 30 years begin to fall apart. The culture does not hold together. We begin to fight. We have people in the Senate and the House that, that believe in God a particular way, and they really want their view of God to be the way the whole world sees God. Church, and we say God, we're both making a cultural statement. We have some norms in our church that we are kind of affirming. We may make footnotes, for example, to the Nicene Creed. But we also are affirming that we have a view of God or an experience of God that is absolutely unique. And we hope that what happens in the church will help expand that view. And so the notion that I have of this is that grace is everywhere. It addresses all things, and at heart it's unknowable. We see God, says St. Paul, in a glass darkly, and so does the culture. And so we have, for me, what makes this work is we have transcendent experiences and transcendent moments that make sense of God. So I'm going to try to address, in the time left, is how to think about the culture's view of God and why Jesus, for example, in this slide is shown the way Jesus is shown. This is um, a statue, early 14th century. There are no particular, in the West, no particular views of Jesus pictorially in art until about the 5th century. It was considered to be idolatry. And so. Um, so after Constantine made Christianity legal, we began to get art. And I have one slide from that period, which is not this one. This is a 14th century crucifixion. And what I want to point out, if we go back, <laughs> is um, these wounds. There's one, there's one on the hand, there's one down here on the feet, and uh, clearly there's the big one is the one right, you know, it says in scripture he pierced Jesus' side, that's not the side, that's the heart. So what's going on in the 14th century that would create this particular view of Jesus where we need it? And you notice that Mary, this is a pieta, 
you notice that Mary is uh, born for What we know about the medieval period is in, in this century is that it was plague ridden. Child mortality was 50%. Part of the child mortality was the way women were dressed. They were dressed to look like the Virgin Mary. The ideal was small breasted and a swollen stomach and as much as 15 pounds of sand would sit on a woman's womb. So that contributed to the uh, infant mortality. Here's a picture that brings that into sacred focus. That concern of the culture, and also if you uh, lost children, if you had trouble with one of your children, I'm sure none of you have. This, this is the suffering that you're in. This is where you live. And you want those wounds, which look actually the way the wounds look in the plague. They're usually in the armpit in the plague or the groin. You want those wounds to be lanced and open, and even then probably you're going to be in trouble. The plague carried away between one and three of every people in Europe, or two or three of every people in Europe, depending on your statistics. Imagine having to deal with death and having, imagine having to meet a God that did this, that carried that experience. So this is the, uh, the Pietà. Let's go to the next one. This is a statue of Mary Magdalene in Florence. It's really brilliant. But you have to understand that the church was not particularly interested in proclaiming the resurrection. Easter has always been important in our tradition. So Paul says in his writing, we proclaim Christ's death until he comes again. Because one of the ways we resonate with Christ is at the crucifixion. And if we get into resurrection before crucifixion, I think we, we distort the faith. It's our mortality and our finitude that the faith is designed to address. It's the fact that we don't get everything right and can't. That we don't live resurrected lives all the time. And uh, when we get really deliriously happy about the resurrection, we need to remember that it came at a cost to Christ, and it came at a, comes at a cost to us. Faith is not uh, morally neutral, and is not fixated emotionally. It moves all over the map. And this is Mary Magdalene. You can see uh, her face. You can look at the teeth. This goes down. If you get down further in, in her arms, you see little animals eating her flesh. It's uh, rather grim, but again, if you're in a play period, or if you're in a, a, a need to know period, of what does God do with intense human suffering, this, this figure again might be what you need. So these first three are the same, the first three are the same. This uh, picture of Mary Magdalene, by the way, is by Donatello. The same guy who did the, the famous dubbing. One back. Now, if you're in the East and not in the West where plagues happen, they did happen in the East, but not in Spirit. Three. You get this picture. This is the picture of Jesus as the emperor. He's dressed like the emperor. He looks like the emperor. And in Christian writing, if you read Eusebius, you'll understand that Constantine was Jesus, and Jesus was Constantine almost. It doesn't quite work. This is the famous saying in his hand, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
And it's a continuation, this uh, uh, slide, is a continuation of the fact that the Roman emperors were divine and the Christians really hated it until they got to Eastern Christianity and they kind of liked it. Here's the Emperor of Constantine who made Christianity uh, uh, a formal religion of the Roman Empire and all of a sudden the emperor is the representative of God in the world, like Jesus. So they, they, they draw uh, Jesus in this through the pattern. This is from about 500. And uh, it's a Byzantine mosaic. Uh, they don't really say, uh, uh, I did, put, didn't find where it was when I uh, found it. And we do the same thing. If you go on the capital of the United States, you will see uh, George Washington ascending into heaven, the model. It's called the apotheosis of, of George Washington, and it's right there in the capital in this huge, huge painting. It's, we do this. George chopped down the cherry tree and was honest all the time. And we have all of those things which were written, of course, 50 or 60 years after his death. Uh, George Washington would be appalled by that. Painting actually, he went to Pohick Church where my aunt ran the altar guild, and she would be appalled at it, so that's the proper standard. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he uh, it, it's just straight cultural mythology. He did a lot for us, and therefore God just took him right into heaven the way Jesus went. And that's part of our tradition as people. Uh, this is um, how. Uh, our religion gets co-opted by politics, by different signs, if we're in a particularly fractious period as we have been, then it gets co-opted by everyone, and they're as confused about theology as we are because everyone sees God differently. Next one. There we go. This is an uh, altar piece called the Eisenheim altarpiece. It's uh, by Grunewald. And what I want you to notice is in here, if you look really closely, you can see that Christ has these sores on his body here and here. Particularly down here it's visible. Down on his legs also. Uh, these sores here. This painting was put in a syphilis ward. That's, that's what it housed and that's where it is. And that's where it continued to be. What did Grunewald do? He said, well, I'm not, I'm not painting this for everybody. I'm painting it for these people who have sickness, which came from America, by the way, that disease, to Europe, and it was a scourge. And so uh, you can see the progress of that in uh, Voltaire and Candide and other places where, where this is. Look, 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 at, look, at, look again at the suffering. But here also addressing a particular form of suffering for the people who are afflicted with the disease. Don't we want God to do that? Don't we want God to take care of us where we live and relate to us as we are? The next slide is one of my favorite <coughs> slides in the world. I, I don't have the attribution for this, but it's, the, it's a depiction of the Gospel of Matthew. And here's Jesus out of the tomb. Here are all the guards, stunned and amazed that he's out of the tomb. That's the text in Matthew. And here's Jesus. Here, here, here they are just asleep. And, and here's Jesus. He's got this little thing in his side. And it, you notice that the crown of thorns really has turned into a crown, and, and it's up above his head. So we can tell that what this uh, painting is beginning to represent is a more optimistic view of the resurrection, that it carries pain, as it says in St. John, when Jesus comes back with his wounds, and people can put their hands in them. But also there's something more powerful beyond suffering, something that God is intending to address, something that we need addressed. And notice everything in this painting is upright, 
even the trees don't have any low or limbs, so everything is kind of ascending into heaven, and that supports the next step. black and white part of a very colorful painting by Hieronymus Bosch uh, in the 1500, early 1500s. And it is, the, the, the painting is just full of color. And Jesus is turning the water at Cana into wine, which is a great symbolic transformation. In the middle of it is this panel in, in which Mary sits with Jesus and notice those eyes. Where does he look? Well, at us. And we'll get to another picture of that like him. Notice that, um, as in much of medieval painting, I've already, already mentioned that the birth mortality rate was 50%. You notice that the connection between the mother and the child is rather distant. And of course, if you believe that one out of every two children that you bore was going to die, you, you might take a little aloof attitude toward your children because you didn't know whether they would survive. Notice the, the signs of poverty in the dwelling. Notice the complexion of Mary. Very, very detailed. Very detailed pictures, most odds and the stars. on magician. <coughs> Next one. <coughs> this is also by Hieronymus Bosch. This is a tabletop painting he, on the seven deadly sins. This eye of God, which is round, is Jesus has Jesus sitting in the middle of it. Here you can see that the, the blood is really uh, there. The, um, Jesus, Jesus has had a better day, although you have this wonderful nimbus around him. And also at the bottom, it says, Kave, Kave, Deus, be that, that is, beware, beware, God sees. So we take the infant eyes and we put it into that eye, and all of a sudden you get very self-conscious about what you've done bad. And we're on the lip of the Reformation. Here in the Reformation, we have two countries. One is the Netherlands, where uh, Bosch painted, and then we have Spain. They were yoked together. The Netherlands were under Charles V. They really hated Charles V. And they were the hotbed of pre-Reformation pre uh, talking and uh, plotting and scheming and all the publishing houses for all the reformers in uh, Europe. All, every one of the reformers sent their manuscripts first to the Netherlands where they could be sure that they would be printed without censure by anybody. So the Dutch still are out there, culturally, socially. Uh, we, when we went to the Netherlands, uh, we were really happy to find out that most of the drugs were supplied in Amsterdam by the Fifth Fleet of the Navy. I don't want to say that out loud. And also that, um, that they have places where you can smoke hot or drink, and all of that stuff is right there in the middle of it without having to go to Colorado. I'm not sure I agree with all of that, but this is the notion that God is really watching you very, very closely, and you better get it right. You better get it right. And this is the precursor in painting of what Calvin will talk about, that you are totally corrupt and God is totally good, an idea which I have thought all of my priesthood. It's, it's nicer in Bosch than it is in Calvin, but you can see the precursors of sin is becoming much more important than grace. No. Not much joy. Not much joy. You have to get down. Yeah, if you don't get the feet going up into heaven, we miss all of it, right? This is one of my favorite paintings just because of that image. This is the ascension, right? There Jesus is feet. He's going up into the heavens and he's disappearing in the clouds. And uh, everyone is uh, stunned and amazed, as you would be. And uh, here, here are all the all the people looking up, 
And I, I want to say this also is Dutch, and it also comes from uh, the same period as Bosch. It's, it's an illustration you can see. I'm not. Sh I don't have the attribution for this either. But but there we are. It's that confusion when you have an image that is true, because I think the ascension is true in the symbolic way, but we know now that the cosmology doesn't work like this, right? They couldn't possibly have known that. The Earth was at the center of the universe, and God was up, always up. In fact, in this period of time, there's a little dome on the top of the seven planets, a little dome where all the good Christians went, if you were really, 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 really good. And Jesus is there, sitting on the right hand of God, of God and that's the way that's going. Uh, I, I just really, I just really like it because uh, then we'll return to talk, and, and then it'll disappear again. Next, this is a Rubens. You can tell just by the flesh on Jesus. You know. He, he, he was, he's famous for all those really fleshly women. And um, they're, they're deposing him from the cross. There's great, there's great grief. But look at the, phys, the physicality. What begins to happen post-Reformation is the accent becomes on the body itself as what? As the temple of God. So that Rubens is in the forefront, as is Titian and some other artists, to, to bring the body into focus as a basic spiritual unit. <clears throat> something that God cares for, something you could care for, and, and, and this uh, is, a, is a very personal, personal uh, uh, painting. And you, you, get, you get nuns, you get women, you, you get those three people who are at Jesus' death or back there trying to take care of him. Here is Nicodemus taking Jesus' body down. We have that tradition as well. The suffering then is not borne up by God, but is right there in Jesus, right at death. So the notion of suffering is becoming more personal in the culture, and that is a progress that was made in the church during the uh, Reformation and beyond. It's just the body of these things. We'll do the next one. Also, Jesus becomes much more ordinary. <clears throat> well, more like us, as the body increases in its importance. This is the Last Supper. Notice that this usually in earlier religious paintings would have been a halo. But now it's a shadow. You can't see it. You can't quite see God's glory. But where it is, it is in this food. It, it's in the physicality and the joy of uh, the physical. Again, Caravaggio died, died unfortunately very young, but he, he was considered to be a heretic and uh, had a lot of trouble. Here, here he is redoing the myth because in earlier paintings what you have is Jesus here he is blessing the, blessing the bread the way we would expect. There's, there's I think the bread, there's lots of fruit. This is an agape meal more than a Eucharist. And so it's, it's really good. You could, you could want to eat some of this stuff. You know, it's just good looking food. And the people are paying attention. Jesus is softer in this portrayal of him. He is um, less powerful in this portrayal of him. And all of a sudden, the, the sense is that, that, that he's more like us. Well, what do we do when we talk to God? We go to church and we go, okay, here it is. Here, we, here I am. Here we are. This is good. This is good the way it is. Because God is present and we are present. And that point is one of the points of the Eucharistic life. Next slide. This 
one of my least favorite paintings of Jesus. <laughs> and, and look at how ethereal this is a reaction. Look at how ethereal Jesus is. It's kind of like the, the, the nimbus is dark like the last slide. And Jesus is going, well, yeah, that was tough. <laughs> that was really hard. And I don't have any energy left. Look at that body. Uh, holes are still in the hands. There is this Eucharistic image, which is really peculiar in uh, iconography, where Jesus is taking the wound that he has, which isn't open, and squeezing it so that his blood pours into this cup, which is not carried toward the church, but is something that this little angel is is, is carrying. Yeah, first. Have you seen the image at um, uh, the, the Catholic Church downtown of an angel approaching with the cup that Jesus supposedly says, let this cup, let this cup pass from me. It's a really striking image. Yeah, that's a gorgeous image. I probably would like that much more than this one. You know, because Jesus is, is having to make a decision that is both human and divine. St. Mary's. I don't have to, I've, I, I've been to St. Mary's. That one looks kind of different than Pardon? I said that picture is, appears to be very feminine. Well, I, I think that this is much more in the uh, heading, heading for the 17th and 18th century, where Jesus is, as a person, his job's done. So the bot in this frame, unlike the last one, Jesus is kind of ethereal. His body really isn't terribly hardy. I'm not saying that that's feminine, that's not the way I would take it. He's kind of androgynous, neither male nor female. Yes, that, that's right. And this. I really don't want to get into male-female politics in the 17th no, century. That's not the 1700s, you know, women didn't have souls in Europe. So, um, th but this follows that kind of image. Innervated, it, it comes to its forefront in the, in the Victorian period, where, where women uh, were uh, decorative. Not all of them, of course, but the art shows them as decorative. This is in that bloodless, <coughs> mannerist uh, style of pain. Let's get rid of that one. Any other questions? I'm skipping over a lot, so. We saw the Eisenheimer altar by Grunewald. This is the resurrection. And look at the bearing up of the wounds, as in John 20. They're, they're on display, and you can see the, the syphilis sores still on the ledge. So what that says is not only does syphilis make you suffer, but there's also a resurrection of it. There's also a way through it. I don't know what that is, but a penicillin would, would help, but they didn't have that for a long while. But then this, this is Grunewald's understanding of grace, that it comes and moves through the whole creation. There is no one exempt from grace. There's no one outside the realm of grace. We, God may be a mystery, but God's mystery in grace encompasses everybody. And for me, that's a strikingly liberating, hello, uh, <laughs> liberating in that picture. We're going to next. Oh my. This is, a, this is a, a painting by McKendry Robbins Long. And it's called Christ Leads the Faithful into Heavenly Paradise. And what's interesting about it is all the people that you can see in, 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 in all these people, there is immediate family. They're not only going to heaven, they're going to heaven first. There's his father. There's, there's his brother over here on, on this side of the painting. There, there are cousins and uncles and children and uh, people that he knows. I was reading a book this week that calls this ethical myopia. <laughs> that the people that we love are going to heaven and everyone else is a little suspect. It comes with family values. The, the writer Ian Banks, who's writing science fiction, says it's about the exaltation of family before culture. 
and it is, in, in uh, his view, in my view, not good. I'm not saying don't love your family. I certainly think we should and do. I called for that. But basically, this view of salvation is that everybody we know is getting into heaven. Everybody in Christ in St. Luke's is getting into heaven. The people over at Ebenezer Baptist are not getting into heaven. And aren't we good? Well, I know you're good. Not bad. <laughs> we hope that they, these people, these people should be mixed in with, you know, the rest. You, you see more dark faces back there. Uh, that would certainly be part of him. He, he was an evangelical uh, and a painter trained in Europe. That his other paintings are really wonderful. This is a part of a, what he devoted his life to, the Book of Revelation. And um, at, the, at the same time, he was having an affair. And both the mistress and his wife show up in his paintings. Go figure that. And figure the guilt in that. And you get this exaltation of, and, and healing of the wound that he has created by his behavior. And all my family. I just love them so much. They're all getting into heaven because uh, it's kind of doubtful that I am. But if I just take my family to heaven, I'll be able to slip in. What year would this be about? This, this was in the 19-teens. Uh, he, he, uh, yeah. and, uh, they did, all these paintings are stored in Davidson. I did a, 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 a two-hour presentation on this whole series uh, at one point, and uh, it, it, it's really ghastly enough to learn a lot from <laughs> Love your family, just don't idolize them. This is Salvador Dali. This is, uh, it looks very simple at one level. It's a crucifixion. There's his wife. There's the Spanish coast. All of his religious pictures have the Spanish coast and his wife in the uh, drawing. And then you get this figure on the ground, which is a representation of three dimensions in two dimensions. If you think about two dimensions are flat, right? What you see if you lived in two dimensions, if you put this pen down, is you just see the part of the pen that's showing between my fingers as it descends. This is the fourth, the cross itself is four dimensions uh, represented in three. This is the way the fourth dimension enters our world. This is, this is what we would see if we added the dimension of time. What Dolly's trying to talk about being the Spaniard that he is, 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 is Jesus. And, and his family are over time and space. Jesus is Lord of time and space, and um, it's, it's wonderful. Notice that poor Dali, everything about Jesus was mystery, and so he's pointing the way to what he doesn't know, as he often is in the Gospels. You notice there are no wounds. There's, a, there's the graphic depiction here of uh, that there, there had been wounds, but on his feet, no. And so they're, they're, this is about transcendence. This, this is about the resurrection in time and space. And a, a new way of depicting it. It's the only thing I know. This, if you need a, a, a name for it, this cross, it's called a hypercube. It's a representation of time in three-dimensional space. So I just wanted to throw that in. Because he painted it while all that physics was being discovered. I don't have the attributions for this. Unfortunately, the slide is, is mangled. There's a really a simpering acolyte. You can see it's the halo. And he's just looking down. And he's very pious. And everything is just really uh, sad. And the, the nun is crying over here hysterically and, and wanting a drop of blood from Jesus. And you can see how much Jesus cares about that kind of piety. He's looking right through. It doesn't touch him. This is a Gnostic, actually a Gnostic representation of Jesus. He's not in pain. He's happy. Um, very, very different from what we uh, looked at earlier. And it, it, it's brilliant because if we don't have some kind of meter in our heads that says, I wonder if I should believe some of this stuff, then we probably are going to swallow most of it and we should just look at it, see how it is with us. Look at those eyes. They're looking right at us, just right at us. And he's doing OK. It's like, I made it through this crucifixion business. 
and encourage skepticism. And it breeds faith. Next one, last one. This is a very uh, unusual painting. It's called Christ Summoning the Dead. It's by a man named Edward Nipper. He's, he has, he's still living and has a studio in Arlington, Virginia. And this is, he, he paints biblical scenes and biblical themes. And I just like this. It's interesting to note that this banner, you remember the Christ holding the banner up in the earlier picture that was kind of banner as he's out of the tomb and the people are spread around. It's the same banner. Notice the wind is catching this. The energy is catching this. This is called Christ summoning the dead. And again, you have this muscular, embodied, very physical uh, summoning that really uh, suggests that Jesus is, is uh, tougher than some of those other paintings suggest. Embodied and calling us to be what we are before God and to keep growing in faith. It's the summoning of the dead. We, we summon the dead. When people die that we love, we summon the dead. We stay with them for a while and maybe stay with them for a very long time. But, but this, is, this is what's saying in, in, as a statement of grace, that, that what is dead must live. Must live. No questions. This is a very confronting uh, painting. Nippers has done, and also uh, some of his other biblical scenes are really wonderful. But this is a body. This is a body. Come out of that. He said it's one of the points of faith. Come out of that. End the line. Notice that the body and the spirit, the wind and the body, are as one. <coughs> Rilke says about death and about struggle in the faith, Rilke says, what we fight is so tiny. What fights with us is so great. Death is that thing that we wrestle with. Suffering is another thing that we wrestle with. Here's the uh, Lord of our faith summoning us out of that preoccupation into new life. In two of the Gospels, when you die, you just got, get put in a big bag. And then the resurrection, that bag opens up and you're judged. In, the, in Paul and the other two Gospels, you just get to heaven or wherever else you're going in a twinkling of the, the eye. But this is, this is that the dead, the, the whole dead, are said in two Gospels to be summoned at the very last day on earth. And walk back into life in God. What year was this painted? This is in the 1980s, I believe. So it's, um, it's, it's for me, very confrontational. Where am I living that is among the dead? Now there's that parable where Jesus sees the demoniac and uh, he's living among the tombs. And Jesus has to exercise him to get him to be alive. So, one of the primary <coughs> jobs of Jesus is to make our lives more livable, more impassioned, more <coughs> full. So, any questions about any of this? I notice we're right at 10. Can you go back through the slides just while you answer your questions? Yep. Uh, Which one? Any of them. Just all of them. Okay, we can run through them. This doesn't follow that. Can I just comment that that's Piero del Sancho? Which one? The, the, the resurrection that you just showed. Thank you. I really worked hard to find it. I just couldn't. Some of these lights are on 20 or 30 years old. Susan, what year is that? I 
I was always struck <clears throat> by this. Um, uh, Margaret Miles, uh, out of Harvard a number of years ago, did a uh, <clears throat> did a, uh, a a lecture on on this and and some of the others, as Skip said, uh, reflecting the um, emotional experience of of what it is to be ill, and uh, and and. Uh, uh, and she did it in the context of the power of imagery and how the church has become so in focused on auditory, you know, <coughs> the word as an auditory experience, and, and, and that we need to develop imagery that, that is as compelling and powerful as as the images in popular culture and the media, because basically we speak now through imagery and less through the auditory experience. And uh, it's 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 intriguing to me, given the fact that that the Episcopal Church has become is becoming less an auditory church and more a visual church. And uh, another person said that 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 visual aspect that is so compelling and the power of image uh, is um, uh, means that Sunday mornings need to be what he said an epic experience uh, and not art yeah an epic experience versus a um, simply a, a kind of cognitive uh, auditory experience so uh, but this goes back to what Skip was saying about the people that have immediately seen images themselves uh, in Jesus.